Two Friends by Guy de Maupassant. Two Friends by Guy de Maupassant. Besieged Paris was in the throes of famine. Even the sparrows on the roofs and the rats in the sewers were growing scarce. People were eating anything they could get. As Monsignor Morsot, watchmaker by profession and idler for the nonce, was strolling along the boulevard one bright January morning, his hands in his trouser pockets and stomach empty, he suddenly came face to face with an acquaintance, Monsieur Sauvage, a fishing chum. Before the war broke out, Morisot had been in the habit every Sunday morning of setting forth with a bamboo rod in his hand and a tin box on his back. He took to the Argentil train, got out at the Combs, and walked thence to the Isle Maron. The moment he arrived at this place of his dreams, he began fishing and fished till nightfall. Every Sunday he met in this very spot, Monsieur Sauvage, a stout, jolly little man, a draper in the Rue Nord Dame de Lourdes, and also an ardent fisherman. They often spent half the day side by side, rod in hand and feet dangling over the water, and a warm friendship had sprung up between the two. Some days they did not speak. At other times they chatted, but they understood each other perfectly without the aid of words, having similar tastes and feelings. In the spring, about ten o'clock in the morning, when the early sun caused the light mist to float on the water and gently warmed the backs of the two enthusiastic anglers, Morisot would occasionally remark to his neighbor, My, but it's pleasant here. To which the other would reply, I can't imagine anything better. And these few words suffice to make them understand and appreciate each other. In the autumn, toward the close of day, when the setting sun shed a blood-red glow over the western sky, and the reflection of the crimson cloud tinged the whole river with red, brought a glow to the face of the two friends, and the gilded, the trees, whose leaves were already turning at the first chill touch of winter, Monsieur Sauvage would sometimes smile at Morsault and say, What a glorious spectacle! And Morsault would answer without taking his eyes from his float, This is much better than the boulevard, isn't it? As soon as they recognized each other, they shook hands cordially, affected at the thought of the meeting under such changed circumstances. Monsieur Sauvage, with a sigh, murmured, These are sad times. Morsault shook his head mournfully, and such weather. This is the first fine day of the year. The sky was, in fact, of a bright cloudless blue. They walked along, side by side, reflective and sad. And to think of the fishing, said Morisot. What good times we used to have. When shall we be able to fish again? asked Monsieur Sauvage. They entered a small cafe and took an absinthe together, then resumed their walk along the pavement. Morsot stopped suddenly. Shall we have another absinthe, he said. If you like, agreed Monsieur Sauvage, and they entered another wine shop. They were quite unsteady when they came out, owing to the effort of the alcohol on their empty stomachs. It was a fine, mild day, and a gentle breeze fanned their faces. The fresh air completed the effects of the alcohol on Monsieur Sauvage. He stopped suddenly, saying, Suppose we go there. Where? Fishing. But where? Why, the old place. The French outposts are close to the combs. I know Colonel Dumont, and we shall easily get leave to pass. Morsault trembled with desire. Very well, I agree. And they separated to fetch their rods and lines. An hour later, they were walking side by side on the high road. Presently, they reached the villa occupied by the colonel. He smiled at their request and granted it. They resumed their walk, furnished with a password. Soon they left their outpost behind them, made their way through the deserted combs, and found themselves on the outskirts of the small vineyard which bordered the sign. It was about eleven o'clock. 
Before them lay the village of Argentil, apparently lifeless. The heights of the Orgomo and the Seno dominated the landscape. The great plains extended as far as Naturi was empty, quite empty a waste of dun-colored soil and bare cherry trees. Monsieur Sauvage pointed to the heights, murmuring the Prussians are up yonder. At the side of the deserted country, filled with the two friends, with vague misgivings, the Prussians. They had never seen them as yet, but they had felt their presence in the neighborhood of Paris for months past, ruining Paris, pillaging, massacring, starving them, and a kind of superstitious terror mingled with hatred they already felt towards this unknown victorious notion. Suppose we were to meet any of them, said Morisson. We'd offer them some fish, replied Monsieur Sauvage, with that Parisian lightheartedness which nothing can wholly quench. Still they hesitated to show themselves on the open country, overawed by the utter silence which reigned around them. At last, Monsieur Sauvage said boldly, Come, let's make a start, only let's be careful. And they made their way through one of the vineyards, bent double, creeping along beneath the cover afforded by the vines with eye and ear alert. A strip of bare ground remained to be crossed before they could gain the river bank. They ran across this, and as soon as they were at the water's edge, concealed themselves among the dry reeds. Morsa placed his ear to the ground to ascertain, if possible, whether footsteps were coming their way. He heard nothing. They seemed to be utterly alone. Their confidence was restored, and they began fishing. Before them, the deserted Isle Maron hid from them, hid them from the farther shore. The little restaurant was closed and looked as if it had been deserted for years. Monsieur Sauvage caught the first gungeon. Monsieur Morsot, the second. And almost every moment, one or another raised his line with a little glittering silvery fish wrangling at the end. They were having excellent sport. They slipped their catch gently into a closed mesh bag lying at their feet. They were filled with joy. The joy once more indulging in a pastime of which they had been long deprived. The sun poured its rays on their backs, and they no longer heard anything or thought of anything. They ignored the rest of the world. They were fishing. But suddenly a rumbling sound, which seemed to come from the bowels of the earth, shook the ground beneath them. The cannon were resuming their thunder. Morsa turned his head and could see toward the left, beyond the banks of the river, the formidable outline of the Mont Valerain from whose summit arose a white puff of smoke. The next instant, a second puff followed the first, and in a few moments, a fresh detonation made the earth tremble. Others followed, and minute by minute, the mountain gave forth its deadly breath and a white puff of smoke, which rose slowly into the peaceful heaven and floated above the summit of the cliff. Monsieur Sauvage shrugged his shoulders. They're at it again, he said. Morsatu was anxiously watching his float bobbing up and down, was suddenly seized with angry impatience of the peaceful man toward the madmen who were firing thus, and remarked indignantly, What fools they are to kill one another like that! They're worse than animals, replied Monsieur Sauvage. And Morsat, who had caught a bleak, declared, and to think it will be just the same so long as there are governments. The Republic would not have declared war, interposed Monsieur Sauvage. Morsot interrupted him. Under a king, we have foreign wars. Under a Republic, we have civil war. And the two began placidly discussing political problems with the sound of common sense of peaceful, matter-of-fact citizens agreeing on one point that they would never be free. And Mont Valerian thundered ceaselessly, demolishing the houses of the French with its cannonballs, grinding lives of men to powder, destroying many a dream, many a cherished hope, many a prospective happiness, 
ruthlessly causing endless woe and suffering in the hearts of wives, of daughters, of mothers in other lands. Such is life, declared Monsieur Sauvage. Say rather, such is death, replied Morisot, laughing. But they suddenly trembled with an alarm at the sound of footsteps behind them, and turning around they perceived close at hand four tall bearded men, dressed after the manner of livery servants, and wearing flat caps on their heads. They were covering the two anglers with their rifles. The rod slipped from their owner's grasp and floated away down the river. In the space of a few seconds, they were seized, bound, thrown into a boat, and taken across the Isle Morant. And behind the house, they had thought deserted, were about a score of German soldiers. A shaggy-looking giant who, bestriding a chair and smoking a long clay pipe, addressed them in excellent French with the words, Well, gentlemen... Have you had good luck with your fishing? Then a soldier deposited at the officer's feet the bag full of fish, which he had taken care to bring away. The Prussian smiled. Not bad, I see. But we have something else to talk about. Listen to me and don't be alarmed. You must know that in my eyes, you two are spies, sent to reconcile me and my movements. Naturally, I capture you and I shoot you. You pretended to be fishing, the better to disguise your real errand. You have fallen into my hands, and must take the consequences, such as war. But as you came here, through the outposts, you must have a password for your return. Tell me that password, and I will let you go. The two friends, pale as death, stood silently side by side, a slight fluttering, of the hands alone betraying their emotion. No one will ever know, continued the officer. You will return peacefully to your homes and the secret will disappear with you. If you refuse, it means instant death. Choose. They stood motionless and did not open their lips. The Prussian, perfectly calm, went on with hand outstretched toward the river. Just think in that five minutes, you will be in the bottom of the water in five minutes minutes. You have relations, I presume? Mont Valerian still thundered. The two fishermen remained silent. The German turned and gave his orders in his own language. Then he moved his chair a little off, that he might not be so near the prisoners, and a dozen men stepped forward, rifle in hand, and took up a position twenty paces off. I give you one minute, said the officer, not a second longer. Then he rose quickly, went over to the two Frenchmen, took Morisot by the arm, led him a short distance off, and said in a low voice, Quick, the password. Your friend will know nothing. I will pretend to relent. Morisot answered not a word. Then the Prussian took Monsieur Sauvage aside in like manner and made him the same proposal. Monsieur Sauvage made no reply. Again they stood side by side. The officers issued his orders. The soldiers raised their rifles. Then, by chance, Morsat's eyes fell on the bag full of Gurdon, lying in the grass a few feet from him. A ray of sunlight made the still quivering fish glisten like silver, and Morsat's heart sank. Despite his efforts at self-control, his eyes filled with tears. Goodbye, Monsieur Sauvage, he faltered. Goodbye, Monsieur Mossault, replied Sauvage. They shook hands, trembling from head to foot with a dread beyond their mastery. The officer cried, Fire! The twelve shots were as one. Monsieur Sauvage fell forward instantly. Mossault, being the taller, swayed slightly and fell across his friend, with face turned skyward and blood oozing from a rent in the breast of his coat. The German issued fresh orders. His men dispersed and presently returned with ropes and large stones, which they attached to the feet of the two friends and then carried them to the river bank. Mont Valerian, its summit now and shrouded in smoke, still continued to thunder. Two soldiers took Morisot by the head and the feet. Two others did the same with Sauvage. The bodies, swung lustily by strong hands, were cast to a distance and describing a curve, fell feet foremost into the stream. 
The water splashed high, foamed, eddied, then grew calm. Tiny waves lapped the shore. A few streaks of blood flecked the surface of the river. The officer, calm throughout, marked with grim humor. It's the fish's turn now. Then he retraced his way to the house. Suddenly, he caught sight of the net full of gurgeon, lying forgotten in the grass. He picked it up, examined it, smiled, and called, Wilhelm! A white-aproned soldier responded to the summons, and the Prussian tossed him the catch of the two murdered men, said, Have these fish fried for me at once. While they're still alive, they'll make a tasty dish. Then he resumed his pipe.